Hi, I'm Jody Davis with the Lehigh Acres Church of Christ, and welcome to our midweek Bible study. We're going through extraordinary times right now with this COVID-19 pandemic that is sweeping across the, well, the world. And it is causing much concern, understandably, but always with something of this magnitude, something that is this terrible. There are also other things that spread around with it. You oftentimes hear people talking about how maybe it's a sign that the end times are near. I read this in the Old Testament, or I saw this, or this person on channel 563 on cable is saying this, and all sorts of things. So you always have this kind of stuff coming out too whenever extraordinary things happen. And this is an extraordinary thing. It's a terrible thing. And we have many of these things coming up now where people even think possibly it's the end of the world or it's the beginning of the end of the world. And that's what our lesson is going to be about tonight. We're gonna to take a look at this and the history of how things like this, well, how they develop. If you'll think back just a few years in the past, there was all of this big commotion about the Mayan calendar and how all the calculations in it and how all its continuity was going to come to an end. And many believed that this was actually going to mark the end of the world. And let's take a look at one specific example of this. An example of this Mayan prophecy thing and that the world was going to end on December 21st, 2012, uh, can be found in France in a place called Bougarach Mountain. And this is a clipping from a headline there, Bougarach, the French village destined to survive the Mayan apocalypse. An ancient prophecy claims a sleepy Pyrenean village will be the only place on earth left standing when the world ends on 21 December 2012. Thousands upon thousands and hundreds of people flock to this locale on this given date, so much so that the small village there was just overwhelmed and it became a great problem for them. Without saying on the 22nd of December, 2012, there were thousands and even hundreds of people leaving the mountain because the world didn't end. But this is a real life example of the Mayan prophecy, which is just yet another example of so many things that have come up through the years where people have said, this is going to be it. This is gonna be the end. Another example that you can find just looking around uh, happened in Russia in May of 2008, there was a sect there and their leader had convinced them that the world was going to end. And that little picture on the top is actually the opening to the cave where they all went and hid and they barricaded themselves in there so that they could, I guess, survive the end of the world. And the big picture, all the people in the snow, they're talking through a little crevice to the people trying to convince them that it's okay to come out. But again, this was 29 people, including children, that were barricaded in a cave because they had been convinced by a sect leader that the end of the world was about to happen. And with a little research, you can find date after date after date after instance after instance of people trying to convince other people that the world's going to end, either through natural means or by the return of Christ. We have a little list here, and we just started at 1990 because uh, we wanted to keep this lesson a little bit short anyway. So 1990, 1991, and 1992, there were two uh, major events where people were trying to convince everyone it was going to be the end of the world. 1993, 1994, there were two uh, instances in that year, 95, 96, in 97, there were two instances that year. And these are just the big instances that happened to have a following or happened to make the headlines. 
1998, another in 1994, or 1999 rather, there were four instances of predicting that the world was about to end. And of course, this was probably tied into the big Y2K thing and everything. And then in 2000, 13 major uh, predictions that the world was going to end. Again, in 2001 and 2003, two more. In 2006, seven, eight, 10, 2011, uh, four times people predicted the end of the world. 2012, three times, 13, 15, 17, 18, 19. And I have no doubt that it's happening in 2020 this year and possibly even tied in to the crisis that we're going through now. Now, of all those dates that I just listed, we have uh, names like Pat Robertson, Robertson, Louis Farrakhan, Jerry Falwell, the Jehovah Witnesses, Isaac Newton, Nostradamus. They were all tied into many of these predictions between 1990 and 1919. Now, we also have people who look at events and they try to predict that we're entering the end times or that we're drawing near and things like this, that this event I can see here and this event I can see here. And we can read about this one here and over here we can see this one. And it's things like that. And I, I like this graphic in the middle of this slide that says the Armageddon clock because you'll see a lot of these people with war maps on their big screens and everything. This country is moving against this country and this one against this one. There was an earthquake over here and these are all signs and everything else. Well, people have been looking at world events, bad events, even crises, wars and earthquakes and pestilence and all these things throughout the last couple millennia in they have tried to convince other people that this is it. I have a little text up here on the top of this, and it just kind of demonstrates one of these events. Uh, the so-called blood moon prophecy, maybe you remember that from just a few years back, where we had a couple years where there were going to be like three blood moon events and things like that, which are, are just seasonal astronomical type events that happen periodically. But there was a big uproar and a big fuss about it. Let me just read it. The so-called blood moon prophecy first predicted by Mark Blitz in 2008 and then by John Hagee in 2014. These Christian ministers claim that the Tetrad in 2014 and 15 may represent the beginning of the messianic end times. So there it is. They're looking at these things and they're kind of putting it all together, trying to, and say, this is it. Some Mormons in Utah combined the September 2015 blood moon with other signs, causing a large increase in sales of preppers and survival supplies. Uh, people heading to the mountains, so to speak, and pulling in supplies and everything, getting ready for the end time that was drawing near. And of course, here we are again in 2020, after everything on this slide, and we're talking to each other. All of the predictions from 1990 to 2019, uh, this huge span of time, all of these multiple predictions, and then many things like the example in the upper right-hand corner of this screen going on where people are trying to pull people in and get them involved and get them excited and get them looking and thinking and worrying that the end is near in all of these things. So as we look at all this, we see that there is quite a historical process about this, that there are always people that are going to rise up and start pointing their fingers, trying to get other people excited and agitated. Maybe they're even trying to sell books and movies and everything else. And so they, they use these events that happen from time to time. And we see historically that this. Let me tell you one thing that I definitely know by God's word. And that is, in fact, the world will end. It is going to end. When we turn to 2 Peter, the third chapter, verses 10 through 12, just look at the highlights here. The heavens will pass away with a great noise, 
and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. All these things will be dissolved. The heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. And when it's talking about elements, it's talking about down to the smallest piece of matter that a human could be aware of. Everything being destroyed. So when we look at scripture, and we can look elsewhere too, but this is so plain, this is so in our face, that we'll just look here and we'll see. The word of God plainly tells us, yes, the world is going to end. Now, we've looked at all the predictions, or at least just a few of them, a drop in the bucket on the past slides of people trying to pinpoint the exact, even sometimes down to the exact day and month and year that the world is going to end or that, that our Lord's going to return. What does the Bible say about it? What does the Word of God say about it? In Mark 13, 32, our Lord to his apostles, very plainly, very straightforward, of that day and hour, speaking of the day when our Lord returns, the day when the entire world is going to be destroyed and, and cease existence, of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. That should give us pause when we see a man or a woman stand up and declare that they know when our Lord is going to return, when they can give a date, a month, or even a year, it should give us pause when we look at Mark 13, 32. In Acts, the first chapter, verses six through seven, well, let's read verse six. Therefore, when they had come together, that's the apostles, with our Lord. They asked him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? The apostles still at this point in time did not fully understand. They were still thinking in the back of their mind, as many of the Jews at that time period believed that the Messiah was going to establish an earthly kingdom. Our Lord to them in verse seven, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Just as we read in Mark 13, 32, only the Father, it has been put only in his authority. And this scripture is quite remarkable too because a lot of people talk about of uh, the Lord returning and reigning an earthly reign in Israel for a thousand years and things of this sort. And it's unfortunate because they're actually in the same situation the apostles were in verse six of Acts one. Here they are, just like the Jews of old, just like the apostles at this point in time, still looking for an earthly kingdom. It's not gonna be that way. When our Lord returns, that's going to be it. The world is going to be destroyed. Second Peter, the third chapter, verses uh, 10 and 12, we already looked at them, but I wanna go back to this one part here. Simply the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Do you know when the thief is coming to your house? Does a thief come by and say, hey, at 10 o'clock, I'm gonna be coming by your house. So I'm ready for the thief. I might even have the sheriff. I might even have the police standing by. And the thief is going to be unsuccessful. A thief does not announce that he's going to rob us, that he's going to break into our home. A thief, especially a good thief, looks for the most opportune place and time, the time of greatest surprise, and then perpetuates the crime. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. It's going to be unknown to all men, to all those upon the earth, when the Lord is going to come. So with a lot of the stuff you might hear with the COVID-19 
pandemic spreading across the world where people are trying to look to scripture and say it's part of this or that, it's the end times. Know this by God's word. Number one, yes, the world is going to end. Number two, it's going to be like a thief in the night. It's going to be a surprise. No one is going to know when that time is. So with that said, I want to tell you right now, it's time to head for the hills. It's time to pack up, to gear up, and head for the hills. And I'm not talking physically. I'm not talking because of what's going on in the world now or anything else like that. But I'm talking spiritually. While we're living, while we're breathing, while we're thinking, while we can make decisions spiritually, we need to head to safety. Let's go back again to 2 Peter, the third chapter, verses 10 through 12. This has been our main scripture for this talk. What we just looked at, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And then I have highlighted in red everything that tells us that this world is going to end, it's going to be destroyed. The heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up and all these things will be dissolved. In verse 12, the heavens will be dissolved. Being on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat. So we've dealt with that. But in the middle of this, in the middle of this, Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, Ask a question of those Christians then. All of the Christians throughout the past couple millennia, you and I today, all who will follow us, everyone is being asked a question here. What manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? That's the question. Since the Lord's going to come as a thief, since everything's going to be destroyed, that'll be the last day of the planet Earth. What manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? And I have the answer highlighted in green. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. That simply means spiritually being ready all the time. Every day when we get up out of bed, and we stand and we look out the window, being ready for the Lord's return. And it has that interesting phrase there, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. And that almost has a sense of urging it on when we swing our feet out of bed. Maybe today's the day. Maybe today's the day when our Lord returns. Peter, through the Holy Spirit, gives the recipe to all of this. There's no need to be consumed by, by political events, by wars, by earthquakes, by diseases like COVID-19 sweeping the globe, by tidal waves, by great wars. There's no need in trying to track these things and guess. The best thing from the word of God is simply become a Christian, live as a Christian, and be ready for that day because it will be a surprise. Now, if we go back one verse in 2 Peter, the third chapter for where we've been to verse nine, we read this. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness. That's the promise in Christ, the promise of his return, the promise through the gospel of everlasting life with God in Christ. But as long suffering toward us, and here it is in green, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord doesn't want anyone to perish. And the Lord wants everyone you and I to come to repentance. 
How do we come to repentance? Well, our Lord taught a preached in Mark 1.15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And that's unchanged for you and I today. In Matthew 10.32, he told the disciples it was necessary to confess him before men. And that remains unchanged. Confessing Jesus Christ publicly as a son of God. In Mark 16, 16, with the Great Commission, our Lord simply states, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. That's how we become a Christian. Believe the gospel, repent, turn from the world to God in Christ. Confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God publicly. Be baptized into him. Then we walk in Christ. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 2, we see that it's necessary to remain a Christian, to live as a Christian, to walk in Christ, not be something plastic and disposable that returns to the world, once saved, always saved. No. Striving day in and day out to walk in Him. Moreover, brethren, we read, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word, which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. So it's necessary once we become a Christian, having been baptized into Christ, that we hold fast that word and we continue to walk in it and to live in it and this is this is the prescription that peter gives be ready for that day that is the single most important thing i have talked to people who have been consumed with it they've been ate up with it they've watched youtube videos here and there and here and there of people showing tanks and earthquakes and all these things and drawing lines from each one to the other one and then pulling scriptures out of here and there and everywhere else. And they're ate up with it. Don't be. Obey the gospel of Christ. Live in Christ. And I'm telling you, it doesn't matter then when that last day is going to be. Because, well, you'll be ready. Thank you for joining us for this Bible study. It is hoped that it's been helpful, uh, perhaps leading to further Bible study and uh, further consideration of the scripture on our parts at our homes. You're encouraged if you have any questions to give us a call. The phone number's on this screen. We try to answer 24 seven. Also, you can find us on Facebook dot com slash lehigh church and we also have our email if you'd like to drop us an email or if you have any questions thank you again